Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of the muscles of the posterior compartment of the leg. Now again, I always preface this, remember that when we talk about the leg in general language, it really refers to the whole lower extremity, that is the thigh and what we in anatomical terms call the leg down here. But if we're being rigorous in terms of anatomy, this is the only part that's actually the leg. Up here, proximally, which contains the quads and the hamstrings, that would be the thigh, okay? So proximal to the knee. Distal to the knee, this is the leg. Now, these muscles that you're seeing right here are deeper muscles. So in the previous video, we talked about the gastrocnemius and the soleus. And if we were to basically remove these muscles, then we would be able to see these. So this is the deeper part of the posterior compartment. So when we look at this region, there are four muscles. We have the flexor digitorum longus, the flexor hallucis longus, tibialis posterior, and the popliteus. Now the popliteus we're going to talk about just very basically. We're going to have a separate video where we actually talk more about it. Turns out there's some other important aspects of the popliteus. And so in this video, we're going to be looking at the origins, insertions, innervations, and actions, and more aspects of all four of these muscles. Let's begin with the two flexors. We've got flexor digitorum longus and flexor hallucis longus. Now the flexor digitorum longus over here in green is the medial muscle, and the flexor hallucis longus over here is the lateral muscle. Now how do I know that? When I look here at the popliteus, uh, the popliteus, if we look at its origin or insertion depending on the text you're reading, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but essentially its proximal attachment up here is on the femur, and its proximal attachment specifically is the lateral condyle. So therefore, this side of the leg has to be the lateral side, and over here on the left would have to be the medial side. Therefore, flexor digitorum longus is our medial muscle, and that's how I know that that's this one. Okay. So this muscle, first of all, originates on the tibia, Here's its origin roughly at this point. We follow the fibers down, and it's going to come down here and sort of curve around the medial aspect of the foot, and it's going to branch, of course, because it's going to insert on the inferior aspect of the distal phalanx of the lateral four digits. So basically, if you just feel your toes, the bottom of them, okay, if you feel the bottom of your toes, and that is the distal part of those, the distal fat legs, this muscle is going to insert right there. So if you put your hand or fingers underneath your toes, that's where it's inserting. Okay? Uh, however, it's not going to insert on the big toe. It's only the lateral four digits. Uh, the big toe, which is the hallux, is going to be the, the uh, insertion of the next muscle. Okay? Now, Given where it's inserting, it's inserting on the inferior aspect of the distal phalanx of the lateral four digits, this muscle is going to play a role in flexing those toes. So what that basically means is if you imagine with your hands, you know, if you form a fist, okay, do the same thing with your foot, okay? Now obviously the feet are not very good at making a fist, um, but when you do that motion with your feet, that is toe flexion. And this muscle, flexor digitorum longus, is involved in flexion of digits two through five. Those are the lateral four digits. Um, it can also assist in plantar flexion. Um, we talked about the gastrocnemius, soleus, and plantaris in the previous video. Um, they are agonists of plantar flexion with the majority of the contribution coming from the gastrocnemius. So this muscle, flexor digitorum longus, can also assist in that. Now let's look at flexor hallucis longus. This is this muscle in blue. Um, its origin is going to be on the fibula, so this is the lateral muscle, and we're going to follow it down, and it's also going to kind of loop around here, and kind of loop around the medial side of the foot, and also travel along the medial side, but this one is not going to branch, um, because it's only going to be serving one toe, and that is the big toe. And so it's actually going to insert on the inferior aspect of the distal phalanx of the hallux, or the big toe. Okay? So it's really serving the same function as the flexor digitorum longus, except this one is dealing only with the big toe. So basically that same motion where you're kind of making a fist with your foot, even though your foot really can't do that, like if you imagine trying to pick up an orange with your foot, okay, that motion is facilitated by both these muscles. 
The only difference is that the flexor digitorum longus deals with the lateral four digits, so digits two through five, whereas flexus hallucis longus deals with the hallux. And like the flexor digitorum longus, the flexor hallucis longus can also assist in ankle plantar flexion. Right? What I want to do right now is make sure to differentiate between two actions in this video, and those are toe flexion and plantar flexion. So this motion right now, where I'm sort of making a fist with my foot, as if you could make a fist, this is toe flexion. Okay? Now when you do toe flexion, notice that you can't really uh, flex one toe without flexing the others. Okay? So there might be a really small percentage of people that are able to maybe flex the, the hallux and not the others, but again, you pretty much have to flex all the toes at the same time. And this is done through the action of flexor hallucis longus and flexor digitorum longus. And recall that flexor hallucis longus is involved with flexing the hallux or big toe, and flexor digitorum longus is involved with flexing toes two through five. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Notice with toe flexion, my ankle's not moving. There is no motion in my tibiotalar joint, that is my ankle joint. The only thing that's moving are the toes. Okay? Now this is plantar flexion. So in plantar flexion, now what I'm doing is I am now angling the toes away from my head, but I'm doing so without flexing the toes. Instead, I'm actually moving completely at the tibiotalar joint or ankle joint. So again, angling those toes away from your head, or if you're standing up, it would be going on your tippy toes, this is plantar flexion. Now, as long as I'm laying down like this and I'm plantar flexing, again, uh, my toes don't have to move, and this would be purely 100% plantar flexion. And this movement would be done primarily by the gastrocnemius and the soleus. Now let's look at tibialis posterior. This is the medial one. It actually lies between flexor digitorum longus and flexor hallucis longus. Here in red, tibialis posterior. This has its origin on the tibia, the fibula, and actually the interosseous membrane. Recall that the tibia and fibula, like the radius and ulna in the arm, are actually uh, physically connected uh, by this joint called an interosseous membrane. Um, it's basically a bundle of fibrous connective tissue okay, um, that joins the two bones and keeps them from separating. Okay. Uh, part of the origin of the tibialis posterior is on that interosseous membrane. And it's actually going to insert on the cuneiform, the cuboid, and the base of the second, third, and fourth metatarsal. So let's actually take a look at this. All right, so here we are. Uh, here's the cuneiform bones right here, three of them. This is the medial, intermediate, and lateral cuneiform bones. Over here's the cuboid, and notice all four of these bones are actually in contact and articulate with the five metatarsals. And then also the navicular right here, navicular bone. So those bones, and additionally the second, third, and fourth metatarsals, those are all gonna be the insertions of the tibialis posterior. So if we look at this muscle in red, we follow its fibers down, and we see that it's also gonna loop around the medial side of the foot, really the ankle, and then go along the medial aspect of the foot, and it's going to insert on all of these bones right here. Now the action of the tibialis posterior is a little bit different. Its action is going to be inversion of the ankle. So um, if you think about what an inversion of the ankle is, basically if you basically hold your foot out in the air, so do something to elevate your legs, so your foot's off the ground, and then sort of move your ankle to sort of orient the plantar surface, the bottom surface that is, of your foot inward, okay, that's an inversion, okay? And so inversion, that motion is facilitated by tibialis posterior. Uh, like these other two, uh, the tibialis posterior will assist in plantar flexion of the ankle. This would actually say foot right there, but plantar flexion of the ankle. And then that leaves us with one more muscle, and that is the popliteus. Now, um, right here I have it listed as the origin being the upper end of the tibia, so the origin is over here, and then the insertion is the lateral condyle of the femur. Now the popliteus is a strange muscle because it's one of the few where, depending on the source, you may actually see the origin and insertion flip. 
So in some sources, you may actually see the origin as being the lateral condyle of the femur, and the insertion would be the upper end of the tibia. And the reason that they're more or less interchangeable has to do more with the fact that the popliteus does not produce a very large movement. I mean, you can make an argument that the movement of the toes isn't very large, but think about it like this. The action of the popliteus is knee rotation. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of the knee, I think of flexion and extension. That's it, right? The knee is a hinge joint, right? Well, technically, the knee is not quite a hinge joint. The elbow joint, that's a hinge joint. Um, the interphalangeal joints in your fingers, those are hinge joints. The knee is actually not a true hinge joint. The knee is actually a condyloid joint, a modified condyloid joint, and if you think about it, it makes sense. It's an articulation between the lateral and medial condyles of the femur and the lateral and medial condyles of the tibia. So it's a condyloid joint. However, its range of motion is drastically restricted um, by a number of factors, including the ligaments of the knee. Okay? But it's actually not a hinge joint. Um, there's actually a little bit of rotation that's allowed that is almost undetectable. You don't even know what's going on. And it has to do with uh, when you're going from flexion to extension and vice versa of the knee. There's a little bit of rotation there. We'll talk about this more um, in another video where we exclusively talk about the popliteus. But it's such a small range of motion that the, you can really just use these interchangeably. And in some cases, the tibia will internally rotate on the femur, or you could consider it that the femur will laterally rotate on the tibia. So depending on what context, it can change how you refer to the origin and the insertion. So um, d just go with whatever your course actually dictates. But understand that the popliteus facilitates a little bit of rotation of the knee, and then it can also weakly assist in knee flexion, um, just like the gastrocnemius and the plantaris from the previous video. But again, by no means is the popliteus the agonist of knee flexion. That's reserved for the hamstrings. Now again, in the same way that these three muscles, gastrocnemius, soleus, and plantaris, were innervated by the tibial nerve, so too are these deeper muscles. In fact, all the muscles of the posterior compartment of the leg are innervated by the tibial nerve. And if you need more detail on the tibial nerve and how, it's, how it gets into the leg, uh, go watch the video I have on the journey of the sciatic nerve, and you'll see how the tibial nerve actually arises from that. And then the arterial supply or blood supply to these muscles is also the same as that of the gastrocnemius, soleus, and plantaris. Blood is supplied via the posterior tibial artery. Okay? And so one of the nice things about the leg, which is the same thing we saw in the thigh, is that those intermuscular septa that we talked about previously that functionally divide up the leg into compartments really also tend to divide it into the nerve supply and also the blood supply, which makes uh, the memorization a little bit simpler, even though there's still a lot of muscles. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the other muscles, that is the deep muscles, of the leg's posterior compartment. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.